right, so women in the 1920s were called these women that were flappers. Now, if you actually watched our beautiful video by the SBOs, you would know that they had that in there, the flapper movement. So I see a lot of people at Halloween that dress up as flappers, okay? Now, a traditional flapper has fringed skirts, okay? And then it's typically very, very short, and it shows this leg. Now, prior to World War I, the average woman's skirt only came to her ankle. Showing your ankles in, like, the 1800s was like, whoa. It's like they're basically naked, okay? Whoa. It was a huge <laughs> deal. So now I'm going to show you. Now, really quickly, most states and cities had laws against the photos I'm about to show you. They were too promiscuous, way too scandalous, and they basically seduced too many men that they were against the law, okay? So now... I am sorry if this is inappropriate to you. So, what you're seeing, now on the right, this is the traditional flapper woman. Now, okay, listen. Hey, now, the reason they were called flappers is I want you, okay, well, never mind, I'm not going to have you visualize it in your head, okay? So, women have dresses made of fringe. When they walk with their dresses, what does the fringe do? Flaps. It flaps. And when it flaps, what does it show underneath? <gasps> their oh leg. That's why they're called flappers. Is because this would flap oh back and forth, as you can see right here, and show this scandalous leg underneath. Now, when women did this, oh, it was awful. Like, parents were, like, so embarrassed by what their kids were doing. And, like, there would be all these articles about how the woman is, like, so promiscuous now and she's seducing all the men around her by the way she's dressing. This is the ultimate flapper. So do you see how it's flapping and it's showing her leg? That is very scandalous. But even things like this, parents would, like, kick you out of your house for wearing an outfit that looks like this. It was way too overly scandalous. Now, in particular, they would create laws that said you could not do this. And the most famous of those laws is the restrictions on swimsuits. So what they would do is they would measure how far it was away from your knee. So you guys know like fingertip length for skirts? It was like that for swimsuits. This was too short. You could receive a fine, today's equivalent of about two grand of, for having too short of a skirt. So the idea that these women were these scantily clad women was very, very, very inappropriate. And so what happened is, is that this becomes the women of the 20s. So what you need to know about the women of the 1920s? You need to know that they were pushing those gender norms and they were doing this because of their new freedom. So your HC, what would be a good HC for this? Flappers, Flappers is the topic. World War One. World War One is a fantastic one because women are getting more rights and also women's suffrage. Women have more suffrage rights. So both of those would be a great contextualization or a hip analysis on the AP exam. We've got legs. Um, I don't think the creation of legs, I think that's going a little bit too far into the past. Okay. Now, shows like The Great Gatsby were a really good book. Now, most of you guys have read The Great Gatsby, right? I've seen you guys throughout. Yeah? So, The Great Gatsby is a really great book that's all about this time period of what happened. Now, if you've read The Great Gatsby, it's all about the 1920s. So, it goes into, for example... Hey, listen. It goes in, for example, talking about uh, the promiscuity of women, the prohibition era, all these different things. So oftentimes you'll see the Great Gatsby as like a sourcing where they will talk about um, what it was like and different things like that. Uh, so I was going to show you a video. Hold on. Daisy looks like a flower. Okay. Now, I want to show you one more thing about flappers before we move on. Now, in the 1920s as well, and we'll see this with the Jazz Age too, a whole bunch of new dance crazes were created to show off this promiscuity. Now, these are ones that you would learn in school. So I want you to think, so Wama's coming up, is that correct? So imagine doing these dances at Wama. Now, the most popular one is the Charleston, which you'll see at the front. But, shh, as we watch this, I want you to think to yourself, why is it 
that they are doing these dance crazes based on what we know about floppers. So imagine that this is what you premiere at WAMA. Dance craze. Well, it's not, it's not yet. So this is the Charleston, which is the most popular dance for flapper dress. Very hot, if you ask me. Okay, now watch this. Okay, now, why do you think they created these dance crazes that look like that and how the flip Shop stuff like that? Lights. Yeah, what happens when you're dancing like that and you got a little flapper dress on? Woo, those legs, exactly. So they created all these different, so the Charleston, that kicking of the leg up and down, all of that is to show that sexiness of the flapper dress. Now, okay, so the next one, that we're, what's that? Uh, so once upon a time, my first year of teaching, I taught teacher, I taught students at Charleston the day before Christmas break. And Eden, what happened is, is basically this, I taught this dance to these students. And I was a new teacher, and I didn't really know what to do. And it actually resulted in a formal complaint made against me with, the, with like my school. And then the parent pulled all her kids out and made them do online school because of that incident. What? So no, I'm not going to teach you the Charleston, because I have a very, oh, it's just she didn't want to dance. And I was like, no, we're going to like dance. We're going to do this as a class. And the parent was very upset that I made her kids do that. So knowing that yeah. that. So next section. Hey, so next section. So we're going to go into cultural and political controversies. No. Oh my gosh, guys, we got to move on. Please. Yeah, do you realize that 2A, you are eating into that time and you're basically at this point at the same time as all the other classes? Yeah, I know, it's crazy. So let's move on. Okay, so. You need to know, first off, the Great Migration. This is a star term. It was actually a required SAQ a few years ago. So the Great Migration, which we've already heard about before, that's the migration of movement towards cities where wartime production was available. So this begins in World War I. So the historical context would be World War I. And people begin to move into the cities. Now, we'll come back to the Great Migration in just a little bit when we talk about African Americans, but we're going to start with the Red Scare. So the Red Scare starts due to things in Russia. Now, if you took AP Euro or World, you already have a one-up on everybody else. So as a quick reminder of what happens, following World War I, the USSR goes into the Bolshevik Revolution. Does anybody know what the word Bolshevism or Bolshevik means in English? What it stands for? Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, AP World and Euro kids. All right, so... This stands for, it's basically the workers' rights. So Bolshevism is the rise of the workers. So the working class rises in Russia and overtakes the ruling class. Now, this is where you get the famous story of Anastasia. Now, if you've seen the movie, the first five minutes are accurate. And then nothing else is accurate. But let me explain what happens. Because Anastasia was a real girl. So what happens is, is that when the Bolshevik Revolution happens, during the October Revolution, they have this storming of the Winter Palace. And if you've seen the beginning of Anastasia, you know this, because it's where they are in there partying and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden they get revolted and they hide her and stuff like that. So they storm the Winter Palace. Now what happens in real life is that it's basically the Tsar is executed, and the entire family goes under house arrest. Now, what happens, unfortunately, to them is they're under house arrest for about eight months. And then the really bad stuff happens. One day, according to a journal that was written by one of the police officers, basically, they staged a military coup. The military comes in and executes everybody in the family. That includes all of the kids, 
as well as the mother in an extrajudicial killing, which basically means they took the law into their own hands. So where does this story then from Anastasia come from? It comes from this lady. 40 years later in the 1950s, this lady comes out and says, I am Anastasia. I survived the Bolshevik Revolution. I survived the storming of the Winter Palace. And I am Anastasia. And she got all this fame. And because of this, the story came out that Anastasia had survived, which is where you get the movie Anastasia. However, there have been 30 Anastasias. 30 people have claimed since the 1950s that they were Anastasia. The most recent one was about five years ago of somebody from America saying that they escaped Russia and came to America. Now, here's what I can tell you for those of you who are like, this is so cute, somebody survived. DNA testing has proved all of them wrong. So Anna died very, very wealthy from the fact that she claimed herself as Anastasia. She did like book tours, speaking tours about how she survived. DNA testing did prove that she is not related to them in any way. Okay? Now, the reason it took so long, though, is the bodies of Anastasia were not found for several decades. They were buried in a mass grave that was unmarked along with several other people who had died in this chaos. Um, they were not found, I think, until the 1960s, and then obviously DNA has proven this is incorrect. So if you personally hear somebody who says that they are Anastasia, tell them to go get a DNA test and prove them wrong because they do have DNA from the family that they know specifically. They have never found Anastasia in particular's body, but they have found her family members. Um, unfortunately for them, after they were killed, and I'm sorry if this is boring you, but basically what happened is they um, found body members, but or family members, but the body parts were chopped up afterwards. But they do have, for sure, the czar's body, as well as I think it's one of the kids, and DNA testing from both proved that they were related, and DNA testing has proved that nobody has been related. Yes? So was the person five years ago, like, 80-something? Yes. Okay. I think she was around 90 years old. I think it was a family member that claimed that their grandparent with dementia had, was Anastasia, something like that. Okay, so you might want to say, why does any of this matter to us? This is Russia. This is Apish. Don't talk to me about Russia. Well, what happens is here in America, immediately following World War I. So what you need to know for the Red Scare, the HC is post-World War I economy. Remember, all of our total warfare pushed all of our wartime factories into being wartime factories. However, what resulted in basically is as soon as the war ended, 9 million factory workers and 4 million people in the armed forces are now unemployed. So we go from one of the lowest unemployment rates in American history to almost 25% unemployment almost overnight as soon as the Treaty of Versailles is signed. Well, what do people start to do? The working class, when there's a lot of unemployment, things begin to rise out of that problem. And in particular, people start to fear this anarchy. So strikes are being called. Socialism begins to rise. And this begins this red scare, which is basically, if you will highlight fear of communism, you need a star red scare, you need to know massive, massive fear of these people coming in. And the HC for this is nativism. Remember that nativism we talked about in the past, fear of foreigners? And in particular, fear of anarchy. So what do I mean by this? Well, now all of a sudden, this is those communist people. Well, these communists over from Russia, they're going to come in and they're going to do the Bolsheviks here. And they're going to rise the working class and destroy our capitalism. It was a massive, massive fear of allowing these people in. So basically, so you can see right here the American flag, and you got the communists here. It says Bolshevism right here. That's the Bolshevik Revolution. Bringing in the anarchy, you can see freedom of speech, press, and assemblage is now dead because of these anarchist communists coming into America. And this really gets heightened only a few years after the war ends. You see, our second major terrorist attack in America, Bombs Wall Street, is directly linked to anarchists and communists. And because of that, people now say, now if you allow communists to come to America, well, this is what they're going to do. It's very similar to how people fear socialism today. Is That's how people fear communism back then, is all these people are going to overtake it and capitalism is going to fall, and that's the American way. Now, Sacco and Vanzetti is the best example of where this fear comes from, and I'll explain basically what happens. Sacco and Vanzetti are two Italian immigrants. Both of them are communists. One night, a guy gets murdered. These two are put on trial. Now, when I say put on trial, this was totally like a fake trial, basically. Pretty much what they did is when they went to trial, the judge turned his back and read a newspaper while they were doing all their discussions. And then as soon as the uh, defense is like, we want to call Sacco and Vanzetti to defend themselves, the judge was like, no, and disallowed it. 
In fact, the defense was barely able to bring in any actual evidence. How do you think they were found? Guilty. Guilty in five minutes of deliberations. And then they were executed by the electric chair a couple of weeks later. So basically what happens is Sacco and Manzetti become the best example of this fear. Now, if you Google this, you will find a whole bunch of conspiracy theories. Um, basically what happened is, is that uh, we do know for sure that Vanzetti was at least a mile and a half away from the incident when it occurred. There were multiple receipts, multiple witnesses that said he was very far away. Sacco also had multiple receipts and witnesses saying that he was not there. What I can tell you is that uh, New York, uh, so the, there's a law school in New York, I think it's New York State University, something like that. They redo the Sacco and Vanzetti case every single year with their law students. And every year, both of them are found innocent. Now, there are some conspiracies about this, in particular with Sacco. Now, in the 1960s, they did ballistics, once that technology came out, on the bullets that were found in the guy that were killed. Three bullets were found, one of them matched Sacco's gun. Now, the thing is, though, the other two did not. And so there's a lot of people have said that it's been placed. What I can tell you is the vast majority of historians do say that these were both innocent men who were definitely communists, but they did not kill this man. Chase, did you have a question? Yeah, you answered it. Okay, perfect. Um, but again, if you love conspiracies, um, I was just barely having a discussion the other day where there was a history teacher from another state that was very adamant that Sacco did kill this guy. So it just depends on what your perception of it is. Ballistics did say that one of the bullets did come from Sacco's gun. Okay, now in order to limit the amount of communists coming in, we created the quota system. And this is also a star term, it is also on the exam. Oftentimes it's usually a political cartoon, which I will show you. So basically this is the effect. So if you're getting a causation essay on fear of communism, this is the effect of communists coming in. Do you have something on center? Okay, so basically we limited immigration. So let me explain how this worked. Today, we do not have quotas. We have an approximate amount of people that we allow but we do not have a quota system. A quota system means that only a certain amount of people can get in. So let's pretend, for example, that we are looking at immigrants from Russia, or USSR at this point coming in, England, and Canada. Well, Canada and England we like. So we're gonna say if you apply, 80% of you who apply to become an immigrant can come into America. And then we get to Russia and we say, only 3% is allowed to come in from Russia, because we're kind of fearful of the Russians. And that's where we get this quota system. In the Holocaust, we had a similar thing happen. We gave a quota on Germany that only 2% of refugees would be allowed into the United States. Now, unfortunately, this lost a lot of refugees that were still in Nazi Germany, in particular, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein had applied to be a refugee, and he was denied three times because of the quota systems that we had in place at the time. Wait, so yeah. do we choose the best immigrants? Like, best, quote-unquote? No, so that's an interesting thing. So today... We choose the best immigrants. So we have a set of rules of who we deem as the best. So for example, people who have family here in the United States, they get preferential treatment. There's one in particular that also says um, people of special ability. So let's for example say that you're a celebrity. You would be granted either a visa to come in because of that. So for example, most celebrities are on visas. So Justin Bieber is a Canadian citizen. He has a visa to work here in the United States. He gets preferential because of that special thing. Or for example, let's talk about uh, immigration from Mexico, which is a highly debated topic that we should lessen. What if there is some guy in Mexico that solves a cure for cancer? Well, he would get preferential status compared to somebody else because he has that cure for cancer. So we have several things that we have. At this time, it's a quota. The first 3% of people every year get in no matter what. And that's how we limit it. Which unfortunately does result in people who can't get in, such as the Albert Einstein, such as people from the Holocaust, that can't get in because we limited that immigration. Because it was fear. It, we feared people coming in. It's very similar. I would say the most, the biggest like synthesis, if you think of synthesis points, if you took uh, AP World last year, it's kind of similar to what we did with Trump's tra travel ban, uh, fear of terrorism coming in from foreign countries. And so we established not a quota system, but a ban because we did not want those people in, because we feared terrorism. And those bans are still in place in seven countries where we don't allow any immigrants to come in from those areas. Does that make sense? Okay, now the Palmer scare is a really good example of, so they'll kind of throw this in sometimes, the Red Scare. Basically what you need to know is I would just highlight raids, which is basically where people would go to places where there were radicals or what they deemed as radicals. They would raid it and arrest everybody that was there. 
So the Palmer raids were again raids where people do that. And so you'll see the guy, so the Palmer guy was in the government, and he'll describe trying to find communists. That's all about the Palmer raids. So let's bring us to African Americans. Now, African Americans, this section is ultra important. Make sure you know African Americans. It's four key concepts, all about the rise of African Americans during this time. So the Great Migration, which we talked about before, you need to highlight African Americans. Because now you have all of this industry in the north, African Americans massively migrate from the south to the north. I would in particular highlight rural south to urban north. That's most of the time what they will say. So basically we have all of these southern sharecroppers that move to new industry. And if you will put next to the Great Migration, this starts African American culture. Because now all of a sudden there's more economic opportunities. They're not poor. They still are discriminated against, but it's getting better. So for example, the Harlem Renaissance is the double star term for this section. So you need to know that the Harlem Renaissance was the cultural, social, and artistic explosion for African Americans. And in particular, jazz music is the most popular for this. So now that everything rises, and a lot of African Americans, and still today, went to Harlem. So it became a very much an African American community. And because of this, they started to have these massive jazz parties, and jazz began to rise. And African Americans were able to actually perform in clubs and speakeasies and not just be the bartender or not just be a waiter. Now all of a sudden they have a lot of power from this. Now are they still discriminated against? Mm -hmm. Yes, not, don't, make, don't think that all of a sudden white people are gonna be really nice. But what I'm saying is it begins a lot of the culture of African Americans. So for example, jazz becomes a really big thing and jazz becomes a major outlet for a lot of people. It's part of the reason why really when a lot of white Jazz musicians began to come out. People started to say like, hey, no, this is different. Like this is specific African-American music. You'll hear that term a lot of times uh, from this jazz. Now, probably the most famous of all the jazz singers from the 1920s is this guy. Who's this? Louis Armstrong. I heard like six different words, but it's Louis Armstrong, okay? And Louis Armstrong is most famous because of one song in particular. What song was that? His most famous song ever. It's in Madagascar. It's in almost every movie. I'm pretty sure it's also in Dory. I see skies of green, red roses too. Oh! What song is that? Myself. What a wonderful world. Okay, thank you. Wow, you guys are beautiful singers. Uh, so, What a Wonderful World is his most famous song, and why you should also care about it, it was Miss Bray's wedding song. Oh my God. Aww. Aww. So, that's why he has a little bit of a special place in my heart, but Louis Armstrong was huge, and he was very popular. In fact, when the 1960s happened in the Civil Rights Movement, he was like on TV and everything like that. He really broke so many racial barriers as an African American. Uh, now, the person, though, that you need to know the most for the Harlem Renaissance is a guy named Langston Hughes. He is a very important person, and in particular, you need to know next to him is poetry. Now, I've heard a lot of you guys in AP English or regular English have been analyzing his poems, which is really, really great because you can know about him. His most famous poem is called I Too. I think it's I Too Sing America, I believe is what it's called. That's his most famous song. Now, or poem, excuse me. Now, Langston Hughes' poetry becomes basically black poetry. What I mean by that is it's giving the plight of African Americans. So in this I Too Sing America, he basically talks about how he goes into a party as a waiter and he gives it to these people and they act like he's nothing. He's like, I am too America. I am too this and that. And he talks about all the issues. If you want a fantastic reference, in the late eight, or 1980s, these group of African Americans began to create a new form of music. What music was that? Yeah. Rap and hip hop. And what happened is they took Langston Hughes' inspiration and they said, how can I write songs about what's wrong with me? How can I write songs about the fact that I live in an impoverished neighborhood and yet everybody who's white around me is rich? How can I write about the fact that African Americans are being put into jails when other people aren't? How can I write about these different things? And it created the rap movement. Tupac said that his number one inspiration was Langston Hughes. And so that kind of gives you a little bit of a relationship. Yeah. I just have a question. Yes. Like, yeah, so yes. The Harlem Renaissance was happening in uh, Harlem, but then how come if you're not from 
jazz now is so like heavily it, related to New Orleans? Well, so I would say that it moves. So what happens basically, so New Orleans, if you go to New Orleans, has a massive African-American population. Right. And so that kind of begins the rise of it. And then the biggest thing, though, is Mardi Gras. So once jazz becomes associated with Mardi Gras, it's because Mardi Gras was in the uh, 1800s as well when it begins to rise. But when it starts to have a large African-American population, they hear the jazz music, you get radio, then they begin to rise. And because of that rising, now you have this massive African-American population that relates it to Mardi Gras, and that becomes what it becomes famous for. Okay? But that won't be on the AP exam, but you could write it in an essay. So that's good. Uh, now, the controversy, though, is going to be Marcus Garvey. So I would make sure to know radical. Now, Marcus Garvey is another African-American that is going to attempt to gain more rights, but his is very, very radical. So let me explain what those beliefs are. So Marcus Garvey believes in what is called, if you will highlight, the Back to Africa movement. So here's Marcus Garvey's belief. Everybody who is African-American has African heritage. If we truly want to reclaim all the rights that have been stolen from us, we should literally go back to Africa. The idea would be a mass migration to go back to Africa. So everybody who's African-American would migrate. The government would be forced to buy a section of Africa and basically create a colony where all the African-Americans can go and they would go back to Africa. That's this idea of it. Now, this was extremely radical, and it begins, it's very much not accepted, but it begins to have this rise of like this power movement and radical movement. Later on, this becomes the black power movement when we start into the 60s, which we will talk about later. But the, this would be the HC for the black power movement. Now, if you've ever seen the raised fist, this is very much an African-American symbol, which we will talk about much more expansively later. But, for example, Black Lives Matter uses this fist. Um, you'll see this fist as a lot of people will do it as a movement. The most famous example, though, of this fist is going to be, oh, by the way, uh, we will talk about Malcolm X later. Malcolm X begins to lead the Black Power movement later on, and his beliefs lead it on. But what becomes most famous for this fist is the famous incident that happened in the 80s. So what happens is basically there is the Mexico City Olympics, which was very controversial. And uh, we had two people from America, both black, that won the track and field. I think it was like the 1,000 meter or something like that. Well, what happens is, is that they had already pre-planned a protest. So the glove was supposed to be worn by both of them. So both of them were supposed to have both hands as black, with the right fist is what's traditionally raised as the black power symbol. However, the guy on the right forgot his gloves. <laughs> And so that's what, why he's raising the left hand is because it was taken from right here. So the national anthem plays. They both put their heads down. They put the black power symbol up, and then the national anthem plays. Immediately after this was done, they were immediately taken away from the stadium. They were kicked out, stripped of all their medals for what they did. The Australian dude is walking away, and somebody's like, hey, what do you think of this? All expecting him to say this was bad. And he's like, I mean, I guess they can do whatever they want. He was banned from Australian track and field for saying that he was okay with this. And he didn't necessarily say it was okay, he just said, whatever, it's like whatever they're gonna do. These two were banned from competing from America ever again. They were stripped of all their medals. So if you look at the medal count, they all lost their medals. He was able to keep it, he became the gold medalist, but he was banned from Australian because this was so controversial. I would relate this incident to like Colin Kaepernick taking a knee during the national anthem in terms of the controversy level. Now today, we're not as big into like stripping of medals, but that's why Colin Kaepernick has referenced this incident when he has been very controversial in the media with his decision to kneel during the national anthem. So anyways, but we will talk about all this next unit because we have a whole thing about civil rights movement. All right, so race riots. Now this is a very, very good example of the problems that were in the 1920s in terms of African-American discrimination. So what you need to know is first off the cause. I would highlight job competition. As people migrate to these large cities, now all of a sudden you have these African-Americans who are going to take the jobs. You might say, well, wait a second, racism, why would they hire an African-American? The number one reason, they could not be in a union. Which means if you hire somebody not in the union, there's no strikes. Also, they can't complain about their rights because they're not in a union, and you can pay them less. So it was very beneficial to hire somebody who was black compared to somebody who was white. Now, what you need to know, though, is if you will highlight lynchings, in all these other race riots, I would personally highlight Tulsa is going to be the most popular. So what happens is an incident is going to occur. Some sort of attention is going to break out. Now it starts in St. Louis, 
where basically all these workers, they uprise. It ends up becoming a mass shooting basically over several days. And it ends up resulting in 200 people dying. From there, it also goes even more. So the Chicago riot. Basically what happened is there was a segregated beach. Everyone's chilling on the segregated beach. Somebody who's black was in a little tube. It floated to the wrong side. Because of that, they began to get angry at him. They threw rocks at him. It popped his tube. He began to drown because he did not know how to swim. And because of the segregation, they would not allow anybody to go and save him, and that guy drowned. In response, the African Americans that were in Chicago began to riot. Everything begins to shoot out, results in 200 more people dying. Basically, what I'm saying with all of this is that tension and that fear and that racism causes this rioting. Now, the Ku Klux Klan also rises again during this time. So you also need to know, I would highlight, rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, there's no evidence that the riots particularly started the KKK, but several members of the Tolstons joined the KKK. And you need to know what we've talked about before, Christian beliefs, lynchings, burning of the cross, everything we've already learned about before, um, all from the KKK. Now, the Teapot Dome scandal you might end up seeing as well. The Teapot Dome scandal, basically, I would just know... Uh, how should I do this? Do oil reserves and scandal. So let me explain basically what happened. So this place is called Teapot Dome. This is a picture of the Teapot Dome. It's supposed to look like a teapot. So you can see this little spout goes up here. It's a, it's a rock, okay? So at this rock, though, is a bunch of oil reserves. And the Secretary of the Navy is supposed to designate where the Navy is going to get their oil from. And he designates it as this. And it's like, yay, great, wonderful. Until it's found out that the guy who owns this land is the best friend of the Secretary of the Navy. What would this be called? It's a term that we've already learned about before. Spoil system. So if you want to write next to this one, spoil system, it became a massive black dot on Harding's presidency. So you will typically only hear Harding most of the time for the Teapot Dome scandal. Most of the time. All right, controversies. So anti-Semitism rises during this time, which is anti-Jewish beliefs. In particular, Henry Ford will begin to rise that as well. Now, eugenics also begins to pop up as well. What eugenics is basically talking about um, how to have the perfect society. So what you need to basically know is if you will star the second bullet. Basically, in this time, people are encouraged that if you have good genetics, such as being smart, such as having a good race, you should reproduce. However, if you are not perfect, you should not reproduce. And I'll explain some examples on why. If you will highlight this third bullet, apply Darwinian theory of natural selection to create a perfect society. So we all know about Darwin, and we know about his finches. This is survival of the fittest. Well, what if, though, a perfect race can't survive because there's too many other problems? So, for example, what if I am a perfect race? I have no issues of mental health. I have no physical issues, no cancer, or anything like that. But then all these other people with problems, such as mental health issues, physical disabilities, and they keep reproducing, well, eventually all we're going to get is a society with people with problems. So eugenics believes, let's get rid of all those people. And that's when we get into the time period where they literally had this issue. Now, if you know anything about Punnett squares, that's where this theory came from, where basically they said, we want to get rid of all of these problems and only create the perfect society. So if we can eliminate pools from the gene, or genes from the pool, we can be able to create this perfect society up here. So basically what they start to say is that social Darwinism again. So social Darwinism, like we talked about before with the schools, this is the perfect school. The Anglo-Saxon Roman, in particular in the Greek. The farther your skull gets away from here, so like for example, you can see this is the Asian, African American, the further you get away, the worse you are. So let's eliminate these problems with the skulls. Let's eliminate these issues and create a better society. So this was actually a big thing. So people would like have these traveling fairs where they would talk about, let's get rid of the problem people. And let's get rid of all these things in the gene pool. And a really good example of that is this right here, which is actually what went up to the Supreme Court. So this lady, who is going to be Emma Buck, this is the mother. She basically would have something that we would call like today. So she had a very low IQ. So it could be anything from autism, partial Down syndrome, anything along those lines. More than likely, it's autism. Okay? Now, she, her mother, also had the same thing. She has a kid who also has the same thing. That's Carrie. 
Well, Florida has a law that says we want to get rid of these bad things. So Carrie is admitted to a hospital where she is forced sterilized, which means she is no longer able to have children. They chemically make it impossible because of this uh, mental issues that she had. Now, basically what they say is, isn't this creating the perfect society? Let's get rid of, if we don't want this bad trait, let's get rid of it and not allow these people to reproduce. Forced sterilizations were very popular for like 40, 50 years. You would take somebody that you deemed as unfit and you would force sterilize them. The Philippines actually does this right now with crimes. If they figure out that your crime is too bad, they will force sterilize you. So in particular, uh, rape and incest crimes in Philippines, you can be forced sterilized for that as well. So what happened is Carrie sued. So some people, in, with the help of Carrie, they sue in her behalf, saying this is unconstitutional. It goes up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says that it had nothing to do with the purpose. It had to do, so she sued for due process. And they said that because the case has to go before a judge and several steps have to be done, that it's okay. So they didn't say that eugenics was bad. They said that she did receive due process. It had nothing to do with what was actually done. And they confirmed that this was constitutional. And because of that, forced sterilizations continued until they were eventually banned, which some states still do have some things about forced sterilizations. Um, but I think California, for example, has something in the law about sterilizations of people who are incarcerated. Um, but this is a really big thing. Yeah. So a judge determines if they're like unfit? Exactly. So what happens basically is the case go before the judge. The judge says, yes, this person is, is, has an unfit thing in society, and they force sterilize them. Yes. So what are some things that make you unfit? At this time, well, first off, I just want to point out the same thing happened in Nazi Germany. So they did forced sterilizations there as well. So the most common worldwide forced sterilizations were mental disabilities and incapacities. Down syndromes, autisms, people who were blind, people who were deaf, um, people who had physical disabilities, people who were born, for example, with some sort of physical malformality. Um, in particular, like if you had, um, like in the Holocaust, people who were Jewish <laughs> were forced sterilized, all these different things. What's that? Okay. So all these things were deemed as unfit. In fact, the eugenics was so popular that it ended up moving to Germany. And one of Hitler's things that he said is part of the reason he got the eugenics idea was from what started in America was social Darwinism. And it moves across. Yeah. Not a good time in our history for sure. Um, so this, by the way, was the justice. So this is the Supreme Court decision. So by the way, this Im imbecile thing means somebody with a mental incapacity, so an IQ that's under 70. So you can say it says, Justin Holmes referred the value of a law that Virginia is in order to prevent the nation from being swamped with incompetence. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So basically he's saying, this is enough. We already are getting swamped by these people, so let's go ahead and force sterilize them as well. Okay. Um, and we talked about that stuff before. Oh, and I'm just pointing this out, by the way. So these are the things that went over in Germany. This guy in, with eugenics brought it over to Germany. Germany loved it, accepted the eugenics program for themselves. Okay, now Scopes Monkey Trial, I'm going to introduce today because it's going to be, in my opinion, one of our favorite things that we're going to talk about. Okay? Now, Scopes Monkey Trial, if you will put next to this, it's a great debate. So I've seen LAQs that say evaluate the extent to which debates of social norms or something like that in the 1920s led to change. So you'll see a CCOT essay all about these issues. So eugenics, you can bring that up. Flapper movement, bring that up. Harlem Renaissance, bring that up. All these are a great CCOT essay of what changed with norms. Now the Scopes Monkey Trial is my favorite because it has to do with you guys in school. Now I've told you guys in the past, one of our teachers as a biggest fear is what is the day that we go viral for something, right? Because we never want to be that person. Now, I always hear some say, what if you go viral for something good? That's great. That's like less than 2% of the time. What is the most likely viral thing that you're going to see? Some teacher did something and it goes viral. And so you always fear that that is going to be you. So let me give you some examples. So this was about a year ago. So this was a class where basically this teacher, and I understand first off what she was trying to do. I don't think that she meant this. But she asked in this question, this is a fifth grade class, what are the good reasons for slavery and what are the bad reasons for slavery? Now, uh, first off, I think what she was trying to do, why was slavery justified, but also why is it bad? So like, why did Southerners believe that this was okay? I'm pretty sure that's what she was trying to do. In response, the teacher was suspended 
She was eventually fired. She received so many death rates that she moved away from the state. Now, in particular, African-American ones tend to come up a lot. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was an incident where somebody who was African-American, they were teaching about the Little Rock Nine, which is the first desegregation. And one of the things that happens with Little Rock Nine, which I'm sure you've seen pictures of, is the kids walked into the school and they're being like thrown things. People are throwing rocks at them and stuff like that. So they picked the one black kid in the class, had them walk down the center of the classroom, and then kids like threw papers and stuff at them to recreate the Little Rock Nine. Now, the teacher responded and said, he asked and volunteered, so there's two sides of the story. The teacher did end up getting fired for that incident. So you never want to go viral for a bad thing. Well, what if, for example, something I told you to buy goes viral for a bad thing? So I told you that this is the best review book, and I still stand by that. In my opinion, this is the best review book. But if you look on Amazon, it's really bad. You might say, well, Miss Ray, why are you leading us to a one on the AP exam because of this bad review book? Well, what happened is, is that when the book was originally written, it had a section on the Bill of Rights. And for the Second Amendment, they put that people have the right to keep and bear arms in a state militia, which implied that the only people who can own guns are people in a state militia. Well, people went viral. People went all over. So if you look at the one-star reviews, that's what people say, is this book is against the Second Amendment. So a mom that was in like a Republican mom group brought this up. It went viral, and now nobody buys it. So please don't trust the reviews when you see this. Now, I will explain next class why a teacher went viral. We will then do Great Depression New Deal, and then we'll do two days of World War II.